Election 2016 resulted in voters from diverse locales around the United States approving $170 billion in new investment in public transit. $170 billion. Let's give a round of applause for the success. And it had a significant benefit uh, to transit. It's an opportunity for us to communicate to the public uh, a better understanding of the need for public transportation and a, a way to improve the future in this country. This um, initiatives are key to mobility and they're also key to economic expansion and providing opportunities for jobs. So the positive impacts on residential and commercial property values is one of the significant benefits. Uh, public transportation decreases energy consumption and pollution, and it is a safety benefit to the individuals and the communities. These transit ballot measures were approved in more than 57 separate regions around the country in communities large and small, and today, you will hear from campaign champions in this roundtable discussion and how those messages resonated. They talked about, they will talk about their campaign um, tactics and strategies that made a difference. So I would like to right now uh, talk about AECOM and uh, there is a video that we will be showing We're the people who turn ideas into reality. A collaborative force of world-class innovators, problem solvers, and visionaries on a journey to transform our world for the better. We are many, more than 90,000 of us, united under a common vision. We work across disciplines, cultures, and time zones. Connecting people through better buildings, cities, and nations. And we bring the brightest minds in our industry together under one name, AECOM. We are an industry leader. We are an industry leader in transit and rail, and we offer fully integrated services uh, to support EDFOM. We plan, we design, we engineer, construct, and we operate and maintain. So AECOM is an industry partner um, that has, has been involved in supporting the numerative, numerous initiatives that create opportunities. So it's my pleasure at this time to introduce uh, the luncheon uh, moderator and the panel discussion discussion participants today. So I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Smith, CEO of Valley Metro in Phoenix, and our distinguished panel members who have a great story to tell you about the success of their initiatives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. Those of you who haven't had a, uh, an initiative or a, a funding uh, uh, plan or an election, probably will in the future, as regardless of what happens in the next one or two years, there's no doubt that the discussion as to the relationship between our local systems and regional systems and the federal systems and the federal involvement in that has certainly changed. There's a new discussion. And so what we'd like to do is talk to people who have actually been in the middle of that. And uh, I'll introduce them from my left to the right, uh, some, uh, first of all, transit executives, and then someone who's inside but yet outside our community who can give us a fresh look. And right to my left is Keith Parker. Keith Parker is on the APTA Board of Directors and is the chair of the, chair of the Rail Transit Committee. He is uh, also and the chair of the Rail Transit CEO Subcommittee. He's the general manager of MARTA, the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. Keith. Next to Keith is Grace Krennican, also a member of the APTA board, who is general manager of BART in San Francisco. 
Next to her is Peter Rogoff. Peter, we have two former FDA administrators here who, after he left Washington, moved as far away as, almost as far away as he, he could uh, to lead, uh, to be the CEO of Sound Transit in the Seattle area. Next to him, Richard Clark. Now, when Carolyn says that there's uh, over $100 billion, like about 98% of that was sucked up by L.A. Uh, one of the most, one of the most, uh, I, well, I can't use that term in a mix, Scotty, but audacious is, I think, what you said, Marnie. Plan, well over $100 billion. He's the executive director of the Metro Program Management for the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And then Marnie O'Brien Primer, who is the uh, chair of the National Alliance of Public Transportation Advocates, and is founder and CEO of Connected Consulting, which uh, deals with strategic information and played an integral part in what happened in Los Angeles and the campaign from a grassroots standpoint. What we'd like to do is have sort of a, a you know, we're set up here, we're in somebody's living room. You know, we're going to make it very, very casual. As a matter of fact, you don't realize it. Well, you do. Uh, there's a fire right there. That, that was what that alarm was all about. <laughs> we tried to set a fire put here to make it realistic. It didn't work. So we're going to do without the fire. But what we're going to do is I'd like to, these executives to talk about their experiences. Because what we have here is we have some issues that range from $2.5 billion, which is still no small uh, pot of change, to well over $100 billion who are uh, you know, dealing with state of repair, extensions, uh, new lines, all and all above, all in, the, in between. And I'd like to have a conversation and, and hear from them about what they encountered. What, uh, what, what drove uh, your region to go after this? Uh, and what was it like? How did you get it passed? Is this the only time you've gotten it passed? This has been a, a long road and this is just another chapter? Is this the end of a saga? How does that, how does that really, uh, really play out? And what advice would you give to anyone out here who is um, not planning, because I don't know that we really plan it, but it's a natural progression that we will be investing in funding as, as local and, and regional agencies and entities in, in our transit system in a, in a very, very rapidly changing world, changing for good and changing with challenges. So Keith, I'd like to talk, uh, to talk with you. Um, MARTA has had an interesting history uh, with, uh, with your transit initiatives. You've, you've won some, you've, you've uh, had to go back and regroup, losing some. You have to work with your state legislature to actually have the authority to uh, to do what you have. So tell us a little bit about what MARTA went through and uh, what was your success. Oh, and by the way, uh, some of these uh, executives brought some of the material that they used in their campaign, so please feel free to let them know when to run the, run the videos. Okay. Well, first, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see all of our friends out in the audience. Uh, and I would, so one of the things, you, you said MARTA has won some and lost some. It's actually, we've just lost a whole lot of them. <laughs> going back, I was trying to be nice. Right, but, but going back 40 years, the agency has not had a, a, a single successful referendum or initiative uh, since the agency was, uh, was formed. And going back just uh, to the year 2012, the summer of 2012, MARTA was on the ballot with the overall transportation big package of uh, spending uh, during that summer, and it lost resoundingly. And in uh, the Fulton County and DeKalb County, Clayton County, areas that surrounds our service area, it was losing by two and three to one margins. Uh, so I got hired in December of 2012, that's when I started. And, our, it, and the success for us, I think, really was not the campaigns. The campaigns were almost anticlimactic. It was to change the conversation of how people thought, of, thought about public transportation uh, in and around the Atlanta metro region. And so we went after that systematically with first making sure that our res that, that people uh, understood that we were a well-run agency, that we had been hemorrhaging money to the point where KPMG had done an audit and determined that the agency was going to be losing between 25 and 33 million a year for the next four to five years until it would be fiscally bankrupt, insolvent. Around this time, they said, this, the uh, spring of 2017, MARTA would be fiscally insolvent. Um, we were able to turn those deficits into positives. Uh, the $33 million projected deficit, we turned into a $9 million surplus. And today, instead of being bankrupt, we have about a quarter of a billion dollars in, in uh, fiscal reserves. We also took on a number of other things that people uh, were saying negatively about the system. 
And one of the biggest things, and I'll show you a video of it, uh, of how we're going after it, was the safety of the system. That uh, the folks from Baltimore proudly stated yesterday that they are the safest of the large transit systems in the nation. We're the second safest, but no one knew that. And so we went on a big campaign called the Ride with Respect campaign to tell people about how safe it is to ride MARTA. And we had friends helping us in this. So if you all can play the first video. Hey, Dre, turn the headphones up. See, I like my music loud when I'm in the studio, but not when I'm on the way here. At MARTA, we're cracking down on bad behavior so you can enjoy the ride. Our employees are here to help you and make sure everyone rides with respect. Ride with respect. And so you can see I made Ludacris look really cool. You know, and, <laughs> and, and I, but we use the Ride with Respect campaign ultimately to suspend over 10,000 people off the system. And with very few repeat offenders coming back, that changed the tone of how people felt about the safety of the system. And in fact, Governor D.R. Governor has on four different occasions publicly patted me and the staff on the back for changing the way people perceive the system. The next big part was to change the way people viewed us in the media. When I first got there, we had an eight to one negative news story to positive news story worth over $4 million if someone paid for a campaign to go after Marta. By the time we done, had done a number of initiatives and got a number of great positive stories out there, when we had our first election back in 2014 to bring on Clayton County as a partner, we were at 12 to one positive to negatives worth over $13 million in free news coverage that uh, the agency was, was receiving. Can I, can I ask you a question? Yes. The, the ride with respect, and then there was an uptick in actual enforcement. Yes, well, there was. So okay. we, that was the component of suspending people off the system and showing them that we were serious. And what was very important about that was we were warned that if you try this, you're going to get sued by the ACLU, you're going to be accused of racial profiling, all those things. To date, 10,000 people have been suspended. We don't have a single complaint of racial profiling and so on because our officers approached it with, the, with an approach of we're going to try to, even when people are uh, acting in an undignified or uncivil manner, we're going to treat them with a great deal of civility and we will politely ask them to turn their music down. We'll politely ask them to pay the fare and so forth, but if they don't comply, we then will remove them from the service. But again, being very, very gentle with them. So by the time, so fast forwarding, by the time we had the two elections, Clayton County in 2014, and then the election in the city of Atlanta in 2016, just last November, we won overwhelmingly. 74% in Clayton, which was the highest win percentage of any transit initiative of that year. And then in 2016, in the city of Atlanta, we won with 72% of the vote, which was again the highest win percentage of any initiative in the nation. Uh, the campaigns were very important, but they were really just to decide how big our margin of victory was going to be, not if we win. The, it was a politics of getting to the ballot was much, more, uh, was much more difficult for us. And so I'll show you the other video. This is a video of our mayor out promoting the 2016 campaign. We all know there's too much traffic. Let's do something about it. Vote yes on both ballot measures to expand MARTA and fund dozens of road projects. Improvements to Hollywood Road, coordinating lights in Midtown, expanding rail to Southwest Atlanta, less traffic in every neighborhood. Go down the ballot and vote yes for better roads and more public transportation. Make a difference for all of Atlanta. Vote yes. And I'll just conclude by saying, Mayor Reed has a very high approval rating, so making him the face of the campaign was smart. And MARTA has an approval rating of over 80%. So getting us on the ballot, again, was the most important thing. And we won in every precinct, even in areas that won't get any uh, or, or won't see any direct building or infrastructure improvements in their particular neighborhoods and so forth. So, it, so, so my message would simply be the campaigns are extremely important, very, very, uh, very important in terms of uh, what you're, of, in terms of don't, don't make major mistakes with them. But in our case, the real work was done building up to getting these things on the ballot because 
if you if you're just trying to put you know the ugly pig out there on the ballot you, and just try to dress it up you don't win and in Atlanta it was turning the pig into something positive uh, and and that's what I think was the story of our success thanks I'd like to have all of you touch on one thing grace maybe not because your election was a little bit different but I found it interesting and Peter will go to you next because Seattle's effort also was not just a straight transit. I noticed that the mayor did a very eloquent job, but probably half, if not more, of his, of his uh, uh, ad was non-transit related. Mm -hmm. It was improvements to streets. It was improvements to highways, streetlights, everything. Um, how much do you have to mix modes? How much does it have to be intermodal? Because I know that in Seattle, it's even an ongoing controversy as far as the mix and prioritization, those kind of things. But tell us about your experience. Well, well, it is, but it's interesting you asked what our prior history has been. Um, Sound Transit, I, I need to, to correct a few things before I explain ourselves. Sound Transit is not an agency of Seattle. Okay. It's an agency of a three-county region that has 51 separate cities in it. Um, and so a lot of people might think, well, how hard is this in, in, in hardcore liberal blue Seattle to pass a transit ballot measure. Well, our ballot measure covers a, a taxing district and a voting district of a much wider universe. We are actually the largest commuter bus provider in the United States now, according to the NTD. We run commuter rail. I mean, a lot of people will kind of focus on our shiny object, which is our light rail expansion. But we're running commuter rail to the north and south. We are a very big commuter bus provider. And I guess those 51 cities cover just a Small spectrum of ideology, right? No, they, they, uh, <laughs> they have a very rich and diverse uh, area of ideology, and um, we passed with 54% of the vote. Okay. Importantly, um, you know, it did pass overwhelmingly in the, in the city of Seattle and in King County, um, less so in Snohomish County to our north. Pierce County to our south voted the ballot measure down by 11 points the largest um, decrement in any one county in the three ballot measures that we've had. Now, interestingly, there were actually four ballot measures. The fourth was the one, uh, the, an earlier one, that failed, and that one was commingled with highway investments and, ha mm -hmm. and failed for a variety of reasons, not because we were commingled with highway investments. But I think, that, I think there's also an important disclaimer I, I, I have to articulate, because that will apply to, to, I think, many of us up here. Transit agencies, and especially their leadership, need to be appropriately careful in what is their engagement with the campaign. And that is subject to state and, and, right. and local laws. We are not an arm of the campaign at Sound Transit, though we do have, when we do have a, do a ballot measure, a critically important function in putting together the details of the ballot measure and also educating the public about what's in it. But if I were to actually, or any Sound Transit employee, I mean, I had to gather all the employees to re-explain to them twice that you, we are not an, an, an arm of the campaign, and there are very clear ethical rules that if we cross them, will only hurt the ballot measure, because quite frankly, the opponents of a ballot measure are often lying in wait, waiting for you to violate those rules. Right in order to get campaign fodder. So if you can't own. be part of the campaign, then our role then as far as technical, but it also comes back to sort of what Keith said. We set the stage because although we're not in the campaign, we absolutely are part of the discussion. Well, and we very importantly assist our board members in developing the plan that they put to the voters. Yes. So I would point to one thing I, I, I noticed carefully in the ad that Keith put up there. They scrolled through a list of projects and what more than anything else, what uh, we found in our permissible, it wasn't part of the campaign, but a very robust public outreach effort. I'm talking hundreds of public meetings, uh, web interfaces that, that elicited thousands of, 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 of hits routinely, people checking out the project map. Mm -hmm. We did things with interactive maps that would allow people to like click on a certain area and they would see all of the different projects, even both in our past ballot measures and the ballot measure before them to see how it would interrelate. We had a tax calculator on our website, which told them with precision, once they put in certain things like the value of their house and the value of their car, how much additional tax they would pay. This is all public information. But probably more than anything else, developing the plan arriving at the list of projects, 
uh, was the most critical thing that, uh, that we did. And it, we had to give the campaign people and our elected leaderships who went out and got the ballot measure passed a quality product that was a reflection of what the people wanted, not, if you will, just the brainchild of some planners in a basement. I think I, you know, as, a, as there, an there's advocate, a broader in Seattle. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, oh, Marie. I, I was just going to say, as an as an advocate, um, you know, two of the things that that both Keith and and Peter have touched on is that ongoing uh, reputational excellence for the agencies. As an advocate, I can't put lipstick on a pig, right? If you're failing your public, it makes my job as supporting your campaign that much more difficult. So um, the best thing you can do is to maintain that relationship with your public between campaigns. In fact, I call it the ABC principle. Now, that's not anywhere but California. That's for federal funding. No, it's, it's always be campaigning. And what I mean by that is everything you do is intended to set the stage for building that trust with your public that you're going to be a good steward of any taxpayer dollars they entrust you with. Every day, all day long, every employee. And as an advocate, being able to come to an agency and partner and build that relationship and be able to take the public information and put it into a way that is palatable to voters, that is, that is mana from heaven right there is what that is. Yeah, I, I would echo one part of that because it's very pertinent to the ballot measure we just passed. Um, in the March prior to the November when the voters went to the ballot, we opened up what was just a two-station extension called U-Link. It was extending our light rail network just to two additional stops, to Capitol Hill and to the University of Washington. But just that two station extension boosted our ridership close to 70 to 80%. Wow. Uh, because it was going to two of the densest neighborhoods in the entire state of Washington. Um, and also, and, and we all have our own geography, but it was perhaps the most transformative of any investment we made because we are surrounded by waterways so the drive, you know, as the crow flies, it was a fairly short extension, but in order to drive it, you have to drive all around a major waterway and loop yourself back into the city. So we took what was a 25 minute commute with, without traffic, maybe a 35 to 40 minute commute with traffic and turned it into eight minutes by light rail by tunneling under the waterway. Truly transformative. There was a lot of press attention. You talk about free media. There was a lot of press attention paid to the fact that our light rail system was uh, experiencing crowding for the first time, or what they define as crowding in the Pacific Northwest, which, if you're from the East, yeah. is not necessarily crowding. <laughs> We're not Tokyo crowding, <laughs> right. crowding here. Um, but the point is, it really blew away any assertion that anyone could ever make in the region that if we built these projects, people wouldn't ride them. Let, let me ask and, you something. And, and that preceded the ballot measure, which was, I think, very important in convincing Was that coincidental, to... or was that in, the, in, in, in deciding the ballot measure, did the planners and the politicians take that into account, or was it just, you know, serendipitous? I think all I would safely say on that is the board members knew when it, the opening was, and they knew when election day was. Okay. That's, I, That's important. I wouldn't want to speculate on what they were thinking. <laughs> You learned way too much at the FTA, I'll tell you. <laughs> One of your bloggers, and this is interesting, it gets back to what we've all been talking about, uh, sad this to say about the plan, because if you have those list of projects, and we all know that you put a list of projects there, there's gonna be winners and losers, or perceived winners and losers. And sometimes I think in our industry, we, we strive for the perfect uh, in transit. We forget that there are other interests out there. One of your bloggers says something interesting uh, uh, surrounding the the, the controversy and the, of, of, uh, of the Seattle plan. This is the best package that we can expect given the political realities and the players involved. It's not perfect, but it's good. And it's long past time we constructed grade separated transit in the city. In other words, we'll accept a not perfect plan to accomplish our bigger goal. Marnie, how important is that in well, selling a message? I think, um, I, I can't understate the importance of picking the right mix of projects. And you asked, what does that look like? And my answer would be, um, what does your community want? Um, what's going to work in LA is not going to work in Orange County. It's Those not are the political realities we're talking about. So there. know your political realities, but also know, also know your mobility mix too. Is it 
is it a transit only initiative or does it need to have other things? And then there's also the danger of being perceived as a, a Christmas tree um, where it's got a little something for everyone and then you dilute the, the effectiveness of the, the funding overall. So I think um, in the, the grand scheme of things, having a strategic vision for um, what you want the future mobility options for your region, your city, your, your county to be um, is an intrinsic part of developing a strong campaign message and making sure that your, um, your advocacy community is on board with what that strategic vision looks like for you as an agency um, is a really important um, connection that you need to make in order to, to sell that to the voting public. Peter, if I had to, and Keith, I'd like to come back to you also. If there's one thing, a sense, a project, or whatever that you think sort of got you over the, uh, uh, over the edge, you talk about the timing of the very successful extension. What do you think it was? Was it timing? Was it just accumulation of things? What made Seattle work? I would say, I, I'm going to give you, you asked for one simple thing, and I'm going to give you three. I apologize. One, congestion in the greater Puget Sound area has doubled in just five years. People were very accustomed to getting from just about anywhere to just about anywhere in 25 minutes. And that has now really transformed to people who are not accustomed to it. Population growth, when we talk about the fact that in the years to come, you know, people would warn people about population growth, and, but it had become very real to people in the Puget Sound region. And we're expecting a million more people by 2040. So we could go out and say, let's talk about what a million more people is. That's the entire population of Seattle and the entire population of Tacoma leveled on top of the density that we're already experiencing right now. And it kind of boggles the mind. The other is, I'd say the projects, it's interesting. You know, We had two ballot measures. The reason why we are so late coming to rail investment now is we had two ballot measures in 1968 and 1970 to build out a, a rail system that failed. In fact, a bunch of the federal money that we had secured to that went to MARTA. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank right. you. So, um, Send more. Yeah. <laughs> and we could all speculate what they did with it and all of the other things. <laughs> but the uh, importantly... You, you talked about those deficits disappearing. I'm not going to make any illusions. But. No, but what was interesting about it is you go back and look at the map of the system that was put to before the voters in 68 and 70. Compared to what they just adopted, it's not all that different. It's not identical. Growth patterns changed in certain ways. But importantly, you know, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. We need to get to Ballard. We need to get to West yeah. Seattle. We it's need to get to the east side. And, 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 and when you laid that before them, and also because of the U-Link opening, showing that you could do it on budget, on schedule, with credibility, with the ridership that comes with it, it's, it's a series of positives. Perception not on, once again. Not unlike Consistent. Atlanta. Grace, now you have, you have a similar issue of Seattle, and you know those in LA and, and Atlanta and Phoenix. Uh, you know we don't we don't have big bodies of water. You have one to the west, but we can basically grow out. We have a lot of space. Uh, you can only fit so many lines in so many places, and your uh, your line and your campaign was a very different one. As uh, as as our systems age, for some reason we and our public forget that things start to break down. That's a natural progress. Uh, I'd like to read a little bit of your ballot measure. Um, to keep BART from preventing accidents, breakdowns, delays, pollution, improve earthquake safety, uh, re replace, upgrade 90 miles of severely worn tracks, tunnels damaged by water intrusion. That is not a sexy ask. Thanks so much. Wait, was, that a, was that the language of the I mean, really? I can't right. imagine. Before you malign me any further, let me... I'm let me not maligning you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's reality, and we yeah. all will face it. I'm, I'm just saying, I'd like to go to the ribbon cutting of the tunnel damaged by water. Right. This is, this is not a university extension or a adding tracks. You had a much different challenge right. that you had to sell people on, and so how did you, how did you address that? Yeah, you won. Um, we won with 70% of the vote. Overwhelmingly. So, so somebody was listening, right? And, and that nerd talk, you know, scored well. But if you go back five years okay. from the election, BART was headed toward other expansions. We were where, you know, MARTA, Denver, we were all expanding. And we had a bunch on the books, and we were, we were completing those. But um, 
the infrastructure itself, we're a 45-year-old system, and we didn't, we, we had replaced some rail, but we had 90 miles of original rail that had not been replaced, as the ballot measure says. And um, we had a complete, we were, our problem was we were really both, we were Peter's, we had huge demands, we were expand, service was increasing at 6% for about three years, it was increasing at 6% a year. Um, and we had a break, you know, we had to put our money into the system. And so we started a um, campaign long before there was a campaign and we started both an internal one and an external one. And internally, uh, the asset management, which is some of that ugly language that's there. Um, I'm a big believer in asset management and it's not just for the nerds and everything. It's so that you get a good return on your dollar. It's so you know where you are and you're making good management decisions. And when I saw what they had, I knew we needed to get from the art to the science, but I also knew that that information told me that the system was gonna start failing. And when I got in the transit industry a long time ago, New York was already down. Uh, Lindsay was mayor in New York, to tell you how long ago it was. And you know, they were, uh, doors were flying open, everything had graffiti on it. And I watched as a professional, them take 30 years to get the New York system out, and I wasn't gonna let that happen to Bart. This was a, change of art. So I had and by the way, I, I, I appreciate the honesty in this and I think that that's one thing that well, got you there. You know, one of the things that we talked about the technical side, but you, you gotta be honest. Keith talked about the honesty in Atlanta. You gotta be honest I with think the agency. I think the issue is authenticity. Okay. And you have to tell people and they appreciate it. And we went out, we counted ours and we did three hundred and seventeen meetings that we went out in public and rubber chicken as we got there. But to get there we didn't lose opportunities. We were in front of the board with the most, I said we had an internal and external. My board loves extensions. Dick White is here, he well, was they. there. Uh, and they're great ribbons to cut. And there is no ribbon to cut so much when you do some of this nerd stuff I was describing. As a mayor, describe. I can tell you, mayors do not like, uh, do not like uh, uh, fixes. They, we like ribbon cuttings. Right, and we'll turn some of them in in a corny fashion to yeah. <laughs> make a big deal out of it. But you can see that with 70% of the vote, people eventually got it, but they got it. We did something we called rust, dust, and rail tours, and we did those two, two and a half years before we went out for an election. And my board didn't even really understand we were going out for election because when I talked to them, they weren't very interested in it. Gets back to what Marnie said about what was your ABC? Yep, always be campaigning. Always exactly. be campaigning. And I just want to give a shout out to Grace and her team. If you're at all active on social media, you need to follow the BART handle because their Twitter account is for real. They lay it out and they don't sugarcoat it, but they are doing it in a way that is humorous and engaging with their public. It's authentic. Um, and, and it's so important. You can't get away from social media now. We have a 24-7 news cycle and that beast has to be fed. And you're either at the table or you're on the menu. And if you're not on social media, you are on the menu, people. So make sure that so, your, your message is clear. But there's a flip side to that. Uh, I have uh, three millennials as board members, and then I have three kind of in the middle, and then I have three that are already retired. Actually, four that are You looked at me retired. when you said that. No, I just was. You're, you're, Old guys, uh, huh? So um, the, some of the members of the board that are on the more senior side of the uh, spectrum um, they do not like this. We have one guy particularly, you know, Twitter is a war. When you're under attack at Twitter, you can't just go, oh, damn, you know, go home, pick up the phone the next morning or something. It, you gotta be like this. And so we have two people that are like that, one in particular, and he's very cutting edge, but he's very factual based. And his job is to explain things so that you don't get sucked into the politics of it. He's saying, this is the way it is. And that get real was very important. And as you can tell by our measure, we put out a list of our projects and they were 90 miles of rail. They were replacing 50% of our uh, power stations, our substations. People didn't know what a substation was until we got through with the election. Some still don't. Why don't you show the video? It, it, it's our way. And of by the way, I, you know, it's I, incredible about the Twitter. You know, just imagine what would happen if someone in Washington got obsessed with Twitter. I can't even, <laughs> well, I can't even fathom. This was before that opportunity. Let's show the video. Yeah, I think it'd be good. Every day at BART, dozens of systems work together to safely move hundreds of thousands of people to jobs, loved ones, events, and new opportunities across the Bay Area. However, all the parts that keep these systems working and you moving decay over time. 
miles of original cables assembled in the 1960s are failing. They've been repaired so many times that they're no longer reliable and require replacement. Our tunnels drilled under sea level in downtown San Francisco are no longer waterproof. Water intrusion accelerates track corrosion and can even result in the rail breaking apart. All of this occurs at a time when we're experiencing record numbers of riders. This record ridership has enabled BART to purchase new train cars, hire more custodial workers, and double down on system and train car maintenance. However, the parts of BART, tunnels, power transmission, cables, and rail, will continue to deteriorate, which is why BART is proposing a $3.5 billion general obligation bond to rebuild the bones of the system. This bond measure will be used solely for two purposes, to replace critical BART infrastructure and to improve the customer experience of travelers. If the bond measure passes, it'll cost property owners an estimated $8.98 per $100,000 in assessed value, an investment BART is serious about protecting. Since 1972, customers have taken more than 1 billion trips on BART. To learn more about BART's plan to keep our riders safe, our service reliable, and cars off the road, go to BART.gov slash BetterBART. It's time to rebuild. Loved about that. Uh, number one, uh, you had a problem, but you weren't whining about it. You didn't, it, it didn't come across as whining or complaining. You stated it. The second thing is how people were dressed getting on the BART in 1972. <laughs> Tad bit different than how we dress today. We also have a picture of Richard Nixon uh, on the line with Pat, but it didn't play as well with the politics in San Francisco <laughs> as they were now. But I, I want to put a couple things on the table. Uh, those nerd words you talked about, those were done by the campaign, and they did all sorts of polling and testing, and we put it out. And uh, we saw some of that information. Um, I, w I, with Peter, I'm very strict about what you can do on your time and what you can't do. But I gave up most of my vacation, all of it actually, to do fundraising on the side and to give speeches on the side. And then there's some speeches I gave here. Now Peter can do it. He has he has different dynamics going on there. But um, different state laws. Yeah. Well, no. And I uh, anyway, we'll have that fight later. Um, but the, the words that we, we used in this ad, and this was just information that was out there, there's a line between what the campaign can say and what you can right. say, but you can reinforce words. So the pictures we use, the words we use, those were all, those weren't just what I thought was a good time or my PR shop thought was a good time. So we put that out there. The other thing is your friends can speak for you and they need to speak for you. So you had the mayor, Keith had the mayor speaking for him. Um, we had a lot of advocates that were out there that knew the situation and they were pleased. You know, the environmental groups are thrilled when you're investing in the infrastructure and not building something new because there's always controversy about the environmental statements and stuff. So we had the environmental folks on our side. But polls were done on who speaks well and no one in San Francisco wanted to hear from a politician. Um, your mayor, not you, Keith. Um, and they wanted to hear from safety experts. And so there was someone that was found that did a ballot statement that, you know, was, his title was actually safety expert. Um, you know, he had, for whatever firm he, or I guess he's with the University of Well, California. your message was different. They were selling a vision. I don't think you'd put a politician up there from trying to sell credibility. But in part, in part, okay, I'll let that go. No, I mean. In part, BART is already understood, the, the value of BART in the Bay Area is understood, but we reinforce that. Our material, you, you right. talked about roads. We, we explained to them that we carry more people, almost twice the number of people across the Bay Bridge uh, than it goes across the Bay Bridge. So under the tunnel, in the tunnel, we are carrying about twice the people that are going across the Bay Bridge. To folks in San Francisco, that means that their future is dependent on BART being around, and that's what we, we have to rebuild because we need to be there for you. That was our message. Yeah. So if, if you don't rebuild today, you're, you're not going to have BART tomorrow, and the traffic is going to get a lot worse. And then we had several corridors where we had, you know, we had showed if BART is closed, what happened. And we could tell them that because we had some strikes and we also had a fire one day, and we were able to measure what the traffic congestion was like with BART and without BART. And we're in the essential service side of things, not it'd be nice if you wanted to ride the.
Ukraine kind of thing. One of the interesting things about this group up here is that there's no Eastern legacy cities up here. Well, you know, I, that's an important thing that I, you know, you, you did in your introduction. Yeah. The issue about at some point you're all going to have to go to a ballot measure. That, I'm not sure, is entirely applicable. Right. I, you know, I, having come out of the East and moved to the West, that is how we'd certainly do it in the West. Um, the idea in our legislature, the most that we could hope for out of our legislature in Olympia was the authority to go to the voters. Right. The idea that they That's would right. raise the taxes themselves to appropriate it toward public transit is not in the cards on the level of, of things that, you know, exactly. this, this is not Albany, right? So it's a very, very different kettle of fish. And even in Georgia, you went to the legislature for the authority to go to the voters. Correct. And that was very important. And that we had to build up, same we thing. Had to right. We had to build up credibility in order to get the authority to do it. Before you leave, I want you to—I want to put something on the screen to the last point. Okay. Um, to play the video, but the, the video is not a politician talking. This this is the video that speaks to our folks, and it was a one that came out, and it was just one that this particular organization put out on their own. It doesn't say to vote for it, but you can see what you can do with your friends, and your friends aren't always, you know, the advocates for transit kind of thing. So, I, would you mind, Scott, if we oh, just play that? I go think right ahead. it it broadens the community discussion here. BART is the backbone of the Bay Area. BART and the Warriors have been connecting people across the Bay for 44 years. BART needs to stay safe and reliable so future generations can enjoy games as well. Let's all show BART some love and take BART the next time we come to games. show the part of Drayvon Green going after the BART security officer. Well, it didn't hurt that this the Warriors wanted to do their thing just after, you know, we'd lost the uh, title last time. So um, it, it, the discussion, actually it was filmed earlier than that, but, um, and I'm sorry you couldn't hear all of it, but some of his phrases were uh, the show BART some love. That was interesting. But the other stuff, he, he cued off some of the things that, and this was in, on the campaign side of things. This isn't the only one that's like that, but um, we were trying to have the rest of the community. If you go to a Warriors game and you're, you know, close to a BART station on the other end, chances are you take BART to the game. And they're a partner of ours, and they wanted to do something to make sure we were around in the future as well. But who your advocates are is, is, is essential, and it will vary, like you said. We talked about uh, in, in, in Atlanta, the mayor was a perfect advocate. That Absolutely. wouldn't have worked in, for your situation. Richard, you know, you guys were the mother mother of all uh, of all measures. Over a hundred billion dollars, uh, many years. Uh, I, I don't even believe it. Uh, you decided not to sunset it. It's no uh, sunset. Yeah. And yet, uh, and you've gone through some highs and some lows. Uh, in a car centric city like uh, in, in a region like uh, L.A., tell us how you got that done. Well, one thing I was surprised when I moved to California was to get a tax pass. You have to get a two thirds vote. That's so, amazing. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't take much to derail a, a election ballot like that. So a lot of the themes I hear are very similar. Uh, we did have a strong advocate, Mayor Eric Garcetti. He was the face of the campaign. He invested a lot of his political capital in being able to get that vote passed. And by the way, he was elected with what percentage of the vote just recently? Over 80%. So, so he had a lot of political capital to spend. Yeah. The project list was critical. Uh, we actually asked the subregions to come up with a list of projects, and then we said we would score them to show which ones would get done first. Uh, so that was very popular, a very powerful supervisor. So if I could, you mixed, you mixed the political side. You asked the region, what do they want? And then with the technical side, which was you scored them to put them to, uh, to, to rationalize or put them in, uh, in, in order. So you mixed political with, with technical. And, and that was overall very successful. There were still some groups who were unhappy with how their projects scored, but one of the powerful county supervisors who opposed the previous election for that issue supported it this time. So that, that fell into place. It was um, really a, a good coalition that was built to put it well, together. Let me ask you, was there a particular project that maybe allowed him to see the light? Um, okay, you can go on. <laughs> the project in his district? Uh, yeah, <laughs> shocker. 
and we will be building the Foothills Gold Extension. We talked about political realities. Yeah. You know, you got, this is a political process. Yeah. And we put together, uh, if you've been to Southern California, you know the big issue there is traffic congestion. And Metro does not just do transit. So we did have highways on the ballots. We had local returns. So 17% of the ballot measure will go back to the local cities to do local transportation projects. And we message that as that a lot of your money is coming back to so your So you're community. basically, this election is basically just a flow through. You pass it back through to the local communities. For, for that amount, for the 17%. And there's a pie chart that shows how the money is split up. That was true sausage making in action. Uh, the pie only added to 100%. People wanted a bigger slice of the pie. And we said, well, who do you want to take it away from? They said, you figure that out. You know, they basically wanted the pie to be bigger. But it, but it was successful. We got a 71% vote. It all came together. And um, we don't have Ludacris. We tried to get him, but he was otherwise engaged. You could have called me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but since we are the home of Hollywood, uh, we did make a short movie that on Measure M that I'd like to show. Los Angeles County, 10 million people, all with different places to go. Metro helps move them with 2,000 buses on 170 routes and 105 miles of rail, and we're building more. Still, LA residents spend an average of 104 hours a year stuck in traffic, and with an additional 2.3 million people projected to live in the county in the next 40 years, the demands on the existing transportation network will only increase. Public transportation took a big step forward on November 8, 2016 when an impressive 71% of Los Angeles County voters approved Measure M, a bold ballot measurement for infrastructure, air quality, and quality of life. For the fourth time since 1980, Metro helped voters see the value in investing in their transportation future. The result? An additional half-cent sales tax with no sunset and extending a previously approved half-cent tax set to expire in 2039 to continue in perpetuity. Among the benefits of Measure M, 40 major transit and highway projects in 40 years, all for an average of another $24 per person per year. So, what projects do the residents of LA County have to look forward to over the next 40 years? Well, there's the Airport Metro Connector State, West Side Purple Gold Line Extension, Line, Foothill Orange extension, Line BRT, West Santa Ana Branch Light Rail, Line, 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 extension, Orange Red Line to Gold Line, East San Fernando Valley Transit, Line, 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 North San Fernando Valley Transit. Okay, you get the point. There's a lot to look forward to, and these projects are only one piece of Measure M. Regional collaboration through a transparent, bottom-up process with stakeholders was vital to the measure's success and resulted in a comprehensive plan that encompasses several elements. This includes funding to enhance bus and rail operations to keep the system running efficiently and affordably for generations to come. It'll also fund local transportation projects such as street improvements and repairs for the 88 cities in LA County. Measure M will build new bike and pedestrian connections to create more safe and convenient first mile, last mile connections like biking and walking paths. New programs will be developed for seniors, students, and the disabled to ensure everyone has access to our transit system. Sustained funding will keep our system in good repair for the next 100 years through preventative maintenance and replacement of aging equipment. Measure M will create 778,000 jobs through construction and programs and have a $133.3 billion economic impact. The passing of Measure M has elevated Los Angeles County's transportation revolution to a whole new level. My ideal Los Angeles 30 years from now may look similar to New York City where people are choosing the train over their cars. I think it'll get people, A, to be outside more. I think being outside, enjoying the weather, the city we have is great. Less time on the roads, less congestion, less traffic. I think we all want that. Thanks to LA County voters, we're one step closer to realizing the vision of a transformed, multimodal LA County. But the work is just beginning, and we couldn't be more excited.
zombies. That's, I mean, if you'd have showed me that video and not told me the city without the areas, <laughs> I mean, probably never guessed that was LA. <laughs> it's a whole different story than 20, 30 years ago. But how do you sell something that is in perpetuity? I know that's, a, that's in every, every one of our cases, you have debates as to how long should this tax last? 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or should we, should we, put it, should we split it like they did in Denver uh, with the capital portion operating that others have done? Uh, I'd like to ask all of you, uh, how do you have that discussion? You guys went well, broke. Cool. Big dollars and, 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 and everything. Cool. I'll cool. just say uh, I was involved in those discussions. We probably debated nothing more than whether it goes in perpetuity. Uh, but it was the idea of our CEO, Phil Washington. If you know Phil, he's, uh, he's not afraid to make big, bold decisions. And he says, I'm going with perpetuity. I might get fired over this, but it's the right thing to do because transportation is an uh, ongoing need. So um, I'm going to answer, and then I have to apologize. I need to take my lead to get to a meeting yeah. in D.C. But... Um, our, you know, it's another one of these systems where the laws and, and structure in different states and different cities are different. Uh, the way our ballot measures work, we're actually quite blessed to have this, is the binding document that the voters approve is a system plan. And we are, uh, and it's a combination of a system plan and increased taxes that are very clearly spelled out on the ballot of what they're So you build taxes. out the plan. We build the plan, and gotcha. we are required by law, by force of law, to build the plan. And after the plan is built, our board is charged with reducing the taxes to the level necessary to operate, maintain, and recapitalize. And that's a law, huh? Yeah, so we do not... It is a blessing. So I, I've always used to give speeches about state of good repair. I have great concern and sympathy for the, the situation that Bart was in, but we are for, if, unless we really mismanage this... We should never be in a situation where our rail cars um, get to be the oldest rail cars in America and, and systems are allowed to deteriorate because with a good state of the repair plan and the ability to control the taxes to the level necessary to operate, recapitalize, and maintain, we should be able to do that. So the actual duration of the tax lives on for operations and maintenance um, once the plan is built. And up and until the voters, as has happened now, that was the case with our first ballot measure and our second What's happened is they came around with a third, so we continue to expand. At some point, beyond 2040, the board will have to decide to phase the, the, the taxes back. So, Before you head out, I know you've got to run, you've got to, run to, 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 to Washington. Uh, after hearing all these and, and putting yours in context, is there one thing, one final message you'd like to leave the group as they approach the question of, you know, how do we build or maintain or, or take care of the system we have in the future? I'm going to go back to what... Uh, my colleague here to the left said, because we actually are finding that we maybe uh, uh, let our guard down a little bit post-election on always be campaigning. And we don't campaign, but we have a, an important public information function to have. You have a message. So I couldn't help but notice that his video, which I'm going to send to my team shortly, yes. <laughs> was post-election, yes. explaining what we are doing. What you just did. Right. So we are, as happens with a lot of things, when the voters are actually facing the increased taxes they just adopted, and the bills actually start coming in the mail, and understand that our, our, our tax increase, well, on average, was $169 per adult per year. It's a very sizable increase, which they are now paying when they've gone to like re-up their car tabs, and the car tab rate is almost quadrupled. So we have, if you will, have forgotten to remind folks what they adopted and what they're getting for it uh, in, the, in, the, in the glow of post-election. And now we're getting back to the business of reminding people what they, what, why they did this in the first place. So I think if I was to leave people with one message, always be uh, communicating rather than campaigning, I think is the better way for us yeah. to say it. But also social media. You asked me one question. You, you made this point that the Seattle Times uh, 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 editorialized against our ballot measure. They've editorialized against every Everyone. ballot measure we've ever had. But importantly, for those of us, we're probably close to the same generation, who think that people are still reading newspapers. <laughs> no. Um, you know, the, the, the number of people who are reading, who are getting their principal news from newspapers is shrinking down to single digits as their principal news source. And the number of that percentage that actually gets to the editorial page 
it is, it is, it is light noise in the background. Social media is gonna get to a lot more people a lot more quickly, whether you're just communicating or campaigning. And one thing I would like to thank Seattle for, I noticed on the LA one, it seems like in every campaign, when you are just, when you're telling voters how the impact this will have on your life, the Starbucks coffee cup has now become a standard. <laughs> yes. Noticed it'll take how many Starbucks coffee cups? Yeah, it's just like it's four. Star and as Starbucks raise their price, thank heavens, it's fewer cups. <laughs> so we can so tell your uh, your good friends uh, in uh, in Seattle, thank you for take that. Care, take care. Uh, thank you, Peter. Let's uh, give Peter a thanks. And now that Peter's leaving, we can talk behind his back. Uh, and uh, no, Keith, we, we we've. It seems like yesterday that we were talking to you, uh, but as we, as you've listened, I'd like to, one thing that, that as you listen to the others and the trials and the successes they've had, and your own, what would be the, the last thing that you'd like to leave with these, with this group? I think, yeah, keep telling your positive stories. One of the goals that we had when, when our team came on board was to constantly have a positive news story, a new development that we're doing that we wanted people to know about. And, and, and so, and we've very successfully done that. Everything from, we introduce uh, farmer's markets in our train stations that we call Fresh Marta Markets. And that got big headlines. A transit-oriented development program where we're partnering with the private sector to build great new spaces in and around the train stations. Lots of very positive headlines. Big uh, coverage from the Wall Street Journal, from the New York Times and, and other groups from all around the country and the world. Opened the world's first uh, soccer field inside a train station uh, called Soccer in the Streets that kids and adults get to play in these different leagues and so forth. Performance art in the stations where the Atlanta Symphony, dance groups, others come in and perform. All these things get headlines and they all continue to reinforce that these folks at the transit system sort of know, you know what they're doing. But the one that stood out the most for us was uh, we opened, the, we, we introduced the world's first urine detection system at our, uh, in our elevators, where we had a problem, and Grace was telling me way? before, uh, just before lunch, they had this problem. I don't know why she mentioned it before lunch. Uh, <laughs> but we would have gentlemen particularly would get on our elevators and uh, relieve themselves. So we went to some engineers and said, hey, look, what can we do to s slow this stuff down? <laughs> I didn't mean to say it that way, but uh, <laughs> what can we do? You had a stream of incidents. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna get worse. Yeah, so I wanted, to, uh, I wanted, well, to, come on, worse. wanted to make his elevators pee free, come on. Uh, so we designed uh, urine detection devices so that if someone were to relieve themselves, it would register and the strobe lights would come on inside <laughs> and the door would close. Oh, this is like the blue chemical in, in a swimming yeah. pool in the summer, right? Well, that's what you're doing. But, you know. <laughs> and then uh, eventually our police can come and arrest these folks who would, would do that. And, and we won international attention on this. So the... The uh, BBC did a story on us. Good Morning America did, did a story on it. It's just all over the place. And what about and, that poor guy who, who spilled his cup of coffee in the elevator? Well, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but in the end, Elevator World magazine uh, recognized us. And I know you're all avid readers of yeah. Elevator that is World funny. magazine. <laughs> and, and, one of the, it, and it became their story of the year. But uh, some of the headlines was, Marta, I see you pee. You know? <laughs> And Marta looking out again. for number one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> looking out for number one. So, so my good. message is if there's anything that really turned the tide for Marta, it was turn the tide. <laughs> it was making sure our guys kept it in their pants. That was that. That's <laughs> that's what and that campaign is not totally washed out yet, has it? So. <laughs> Grace, we're going to ask Top you to follow that. that. <laughs> One takeaway that we actually heard his story about the thing, and we, oh, we tried great. it, and uh, we went to floors that don't have any seams in it, so that after they do their business and we clean it up, we can't smell it because it was getting under the floor. Ooh, this gotcha. Dick White, this is where our, you know, we've gone to the homeless and all of that. So it's it's another few, but our voters, our voters care about that stuff. And, you do. And and what you do is you listen to your voters. I mean, you listen to your customers, but. 
our, the people that have to vote on these things are bigger than uh, BART. And so what we had to do was explain BART to those people that didn't ride BART. So we have, you know, say 300,000 people that are riding it every day, but a lot more than that are going to be voting on the measure. So uh, the communication, I think, was mentioned before. We already have our video, too, I didn't bring it, but of what we're doing afterwards. And we're going back to those same 317 rubber chicken circuits, and we're saying this is what we're doing. I've already given four or five of those speeches. Um, we're trying to hone the message, so we're testing it right now. And what we're saying is this is what you voted for. This is what we're doing. We let $300 million worth of bonds in May, and here's where the dollars are going. And you can follow us. We'll be putting up on the web page all the projects that we expect to do in this measure and then follow it increment and then what we're planning on doing in the future comment on it and we started with a citizens committee just as I think was shown in LA and where they started and we'll we have already reconvened that group twice to say this is what we're doing because there's some questions they always want to make sure it's there and then part of our measure was also a citizens committee to meet quarterly um, to oversee the bond expenditures they don't get to pick the projects that we do right but they get to see the so accountability. The, that's right, and that's what it's all about is accountability. And what we said is if we do something wrong, if we say we're gonna do this many uh, substations and we don't get to it, we'll put it online, why we didn't do it, and, or what we didn't do and why we didn't do it, why it didn't get done. Thank you. Now, as we wind down with Richard and, and then Marnie, we're going to open it up to questions for a few minutes. We have two microphones here at the, at the front in the middle of the, uh, of the thing. So if you go to the, if you go to the microphone, We'll, uh, we'll open it up. Richard, one takeaway, and then Marnie, you can wrap it up for us. With, with uh, You've been observing uh, a lot quietly over there, but we'd like you, as the advocate and the outsider, to give us a, a wrap up here. I would say the importance of building coalitions in the community that's with businesses. Uh, businesses often provide the funding for these campaigns. They're not cheap to do. Community group, community activists, and of course, the political side of it, which again, as I said, I thought was essential in getting this passed. I did want to mention, uh, we're writing a lessons learned on the Measure M campaign. We expect to have it done in about two months. So that's certainly something I'll provide to APTA and you could find on Metro's website. Great. So Marnie, bring us home, wrap it up for us uh, <laughs> before we go to questions. What have you noticed? Uh, what additional suggestions would you give? Well, I think as transit professionals, um, you all have your, your own language, right? Um, and we're, we're very much in this, in the trenches, all day long, every day. Um, and so you eat, sleep, and breathe transit. But the people that you're trying to convince to vote for this, they don't. They don't speak your language, and it's really one of very many things that are on their radar screen, if it's on their radar screen at all, especially if they don't use your system. So messages that resonate with, um, with the voting public, um, I'd like to give a, a shout out to a, a colleague of mine, Tom Shrout, for I think a genius message, transit, some of us ride it, all of us need it. Um, and that really you know, relates to how you build a sense of community around um, your, your transportation network. We really provide the foundation for economic growth, um, for quality of life, and that's what you're selling to people. You're not selling a transit network. You're selling a better quality of life. You're selling the opportunity to have a better life, the opportunity to contribute. And so as a campaign, polling on those messages is, is absolutely critical. Polling came up earlier, but I would just encourage you um, as an agency to, um, to work with your, your campaign, work with your advocacy community, because your, your campaign and your advocates can do things that don't uh, uh, meet the public records request, right? So if you want to know about something and you don't want to have to release it, that's what the campaign is for. If you want people to be out in the community as your champions, talking about all of the great work you do, you have to cultivate those relationships in between campaign times. You don't want to be a fair weather agency, right? You want to be out there doing great work every day and being recognized for it. That's where a good relationship with your advocacy community, with your potential coalition partners, as Richard uh, mentioned, for um, for participating um, in, your, in your future transportation measures comes to the, to the fore. Uh, there are really three types of, of audiences. There's your sinners, your saints, and your unconverted. 
The saints are the, your writers, hopefully. They're the people that take your system every day. They're the people that love your system. There's the sinners. Those are the people you are never going to win over. They're never going to vote for you. The unconverted is where campaigns spend their most energy because those are the people, the persuadables. Those are the folks that are on the fence about the good work you do, and that's why having such a strong message is important. Again, social media is a, a really uh, useful and cost-effective way to reach your voting public. You can follow me on Twitter, at Transpo Marnie, if you are interested in that. I tweet about this stuff all the time. Um, but NAPTA has a uh, local coalition grant. So for those of you in the audience that might be advocates or have advocates in your community, if you're not aware of this um, grant application, it comes out every year. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to APTA for funding that. It allows us to fund local coalitions who are there to support future transit measures in your community and get the voters out. So if you um, go to the APTA website and, and look for NAPTA, you'll see information about that grant. It should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Great. And the idea is messaging never ends. Celebrate your successes. I love that. There's, we have a saying, we celebrate our successes, and there's no small success. Everything. Because those majority of people who never write our system will determine our future. And uh, it, it depends. It's, 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 uh, in Phoenix, it's 85% of the people, uh, commuters every day, actually vote. 15% write our system. The other either rarely do or never do. I know we had a question back here, a couple of questions. So from the front microphone, go right ahead. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, my name is Paresh Puri and I work for a small woman-owned business by the name of Road Fox. And I know MARA and LA Metro is pretty big in promoting diversity and small businesses, but I don't know about BART and LA Metro's. Uh, if you could please shed some light on it. I appreciate it. Thank you. We included, uh, we, we reached out to our DBE community, uh, women-owned businesses in, uh, you know, we've been with them for a long time. We have some committees, but more importantly, we include um, a very diverse set of contractors, which was very important for us to explain during the campaign. We got challenged on it by the well, majority community or something at some point, and we have a good program that's laid out. It's very critical to us. Um, our ridership is 63% people of color. Um, our employees are 63% people of color, roughly. You know, it goes up and down. But um, and our use of contractors is something around. It varies between 23% and down to 19, but we keep going up. And so um, we w really want the money that is raised in the community to be spent in the community by community providers as much as possible. So it was a, you know, a important part of our campaign. We didn't really talk about the campaign side of this, and I don't mean, I mean the Bart's role in the campaign, not the legally legal campaign stuff. Not that I'm the illegal campaign, but <laughs> the government providing of information, but that was one of the pieces of information we did provide in our uh, explanation of what the ballot measure meant. Can I? Go ahead, Richard. And same with LA Metro, that's an important goal of Metro overall is the promotion of small and disadvantaged businesses, and we have been growing in that area, area every year. Actually, at, at Metro, um, if the contract value is $3 million or less, it has to go to a small business. It's a, it's a great program. We're actually unbundling our contracts so that they're not so big, so that they're more accessible. And we also have a micro, what we call a micro program where we're trying to get folks in and just get them used to our process because you know government process is thick and hard to deal with often. And so we have varying levels of programs. I'd be happy to. And I appreciate what Grace said. I appreciate what Grace said. And the fact is that it's not only, I mean, for us, about Metro, it's the DB is, is the beginning point. We don't do this so we can we can fill out a report or whatever. It's good business to include those people. And one thing I love what you said, those people who invest in our system should, re should participate in our system, should reap the benefits. Another question? Okay. Yes, Mr. Parker, I just thought I'd ask you if you could share with us with the public message that's important to build support with all the stakeholders, even those that don't use transit, how uh, Atlanta helped out, uh, how MARTA helped out Atlanta in its hour need with I-85. How did you uh, show the benefits of uh, your ability to step up in that hour when the bridge collapsed? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, 
and, and again, that started, for, for those of you who don't know what, what he was referring to, it, it made national headlines, though. There was a major bridge that uh, uh, was severely damaged by fire, and, and this bridge carries hundreds of thousands of people per day, and as a result of it being shut down for a few weeks, uh, the governor and the mayor and many others pushed the need to use mass transit. Had we not built up our credibility, they would not have told those folks switch over to mass transit. And so we saw a nice ridership spike and then received accolades very recently when uh, DOT Secretary Chow came into town and she singled out MARTA and our efforts uh, in helping to, uh, to bring back uh, or uh, in helping to keep the community moving. And we think it'll give us some positive ongoing benefit uh, moving forward. Okay. As we wrap it up, I don't see anyone else out there. As we wrap it up, uh, first of all, I'd like you to give a, a round of applause to our family members. Okay. And I think, I think the messages that I got were, number one, perception is very important. Number two, you don't, nothing comes free. You've got to earn it. You've got to perform every day. Messaging, knowing who you're talking to, and always keeping the long-term, uh, you know, although I know Wait, Peter actually, when we say campaign, it's like he has a fit. We know what we're talking about. You're always, you're always messaging for that next measure, whatever it is, that campaign or whatever. You're always on the clock, so to speak, and so you need to earn it. So I'd like to thank you for, for sticking around and, be, and listening to this. I thought that was, I learned a lot, so I hope you did also. I'd like to mention that tomorrow, you can also learn a lot. One of the big items of discussion, as you all know, is the future of, uh, of autonomous vehicles uh, in our, and the impact it will have on our industry. Uh, tomorrow's luncheon, we're going to have General Motors is going to be here uh, to discuss this very thing. So I want to make sure that I know it's tough sometimes to stay through the end, but tomorrow's luncheon, we have a, uh, we have a, a good speaker. Now, what I'd also like to do is Keith gets another chance to shine here uh, to push Ludacris off the stage. He doesn't have Ludacris, but he does have Ann Derby, who's the Expo Vice Chair. And they're going to talk to us about the exciting things that are going on, oh, that are going on uh, in Atlanta. Uh, come the fall. So, Ann, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a 30-second promo. Real quick, I um, just want to, I am Ann Derby, Director of Marketing with Init Innovations and Transportation, based in Chesapeake, and also, as uh, Scott has mentioned, the um, Advisory Committee for Ep Expo, the Vice Chair. So, um, Expo is the biggest show that um, APTA does every three years, and I want to give you four reasons why you should attend. Uh, first, to meet with over 800 transit professionals and learn about what's going on in the industry. Also, to share and collaborate with more than 12,000 industry peers. This is a great place to discover effective and inventive solutions for your business. To expand your knowledge through the free educational sessions. And then finally, to maximize your productivity. And this is through the experiencing and exploring everything that's on the show floor, all under one roof at APTA Expo. So registration is now open. You can visit aptaexpo.com and you can register and you can also book your rooms. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce um, someone who you already know, uh, right the uh, uh, champion for the uh, Looking out for number one? Is that what you, you said it was? Um, Keith Parker. All right, well, I'll stay right here and just uh, want to extend a welcome to Atlanta. Uh, we're going to have a great, great time there. The, the expo uh, will give us an opportunity to feature a number of great new assets that the city is bringing on board, including the opening of the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which would be a state-of-the-art, fantastic facility within walking distance of where we will be. Uh, we are right in the heart of where Centennial Olympic Park uh, is and a whole host of incredible things that we're going to have planned for you. We have the world's best in terms of time from the airport to downtown. You get on, uh, you, you get on a train in less than three minutes from Delta or Southwest baggage claim onto our rail platform and 16 minutes later, we'll have you in the conference hotel for $2.50. And in this case, we're going to let you all ride for free. So, so we're going to do that for you and just going to have a really, really nice time, some really great uh, uh, excursions for your spouses and significant others, and then also some great technical programs that you'll be able to, to, to be able to see some of the things that uh, we've got going on with the transit system. So we're really excited about it. Uh, get registered. 
get your folks, uh, get your rooms, and, and uh, get as many of your colleagues to come with you as well. Last thing I'll mention on it, we're going to have a really neat service project. We're asking that all folks bring one outfit, just one outfit that you haven't worn for more than a year. Uh, uh, studies show that if you haven't worn an outfit for more than a year, there's less than a 1% chance you'll ever wear it again. Uh, so bring one of these outfits with you, and we're going to donate it. We want to have the, the biggest donation of this type to a couple of community service organizations. So bring that outfit, feel better about what you do, and we're going to turn it over to some people who will use it to get back out into the job market and so on. So come to Atlanta and have a great time. Let me guess. My outfit. My guess is that my outfit will be a smaller waist size than what I'm wearing now, I would guess. So remember, thank you. Expo, annual meeting, don't piss away this opportunity. Remember, when you're at Expo, you're in Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs>